everyone. Just to get seated before we begin our program tonight. I'm James Crumble from ABC 27 News. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Channel 27 has been a big supporter of Mission Central, of course, as are all of you, which is why you are here tonight. So thank you again for being here through you and others. Mission Central enables people through its center in Mechanicsburg and its hub spread across several states to wrap their arms around the world. In fact, there is hardly a day that goes by that someone or somewhere around this planet are being given hope by the resources provided through Mission Central. So give yourselves a hand tonight. And as you go through the evening and you see all the many wonderful things Mission Central does, that is why we are all here tonight to enable them to continue to do this work for the year and even the years to come. Now it is a pleasure to welcome to the microphone Bishop Jeremiah Park, the resident bishop of the Suspend Conference of the United Methodist Church. And while he is coming forward, can we have his life please and please stand? Thank you very much. Bishop Park will now lead us in the invocation and offer the blessing for tonight's day. I greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ our Savior, the Redeemer, Prince of Peace, healer of our brokenness, and hope of the world, and resident bishop of Harrisburg area, serving Susquehanna in your conference, I would like to welcome each one of you to this just magnificent gathering of God's people in Christ's name. Good Friday showed what the world could do, but thanks be to God, that is not the end of the story. Easter morning has broken. Easter shows what our God can do. Amen. With a God who raised Jesus from the dead, hope lives on. You know the story of Joseph of Arimathea in the Bible? He was a rich person with some influence. When Jesus died on the cross, he boldly approached the pilot and asked for the body of Jesus to bury him in a tomb that he prepared for himself. So people asked him, you know, you are a rich person and you must have had prepared a really nice tomb for yourself. Why did you give it up for Jesus? And he answered, because I knew that he would be staying there just for the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Don't quote me on this. <laughs> story is in the 17th chapter of Gospel of Mark, <laughs> meaning that it's not in the Bible. <laughs> but one of my favorite passages in the Bible is 1 Peter 3.15. This is in the Bible. <laughs> Always be prepared to give an answer to those who ask you the reason for hope that is in you. The reason Christ with us is the reason for hope that is in us. But I would like to say this, God's people like you, who represent the ministry of Mission Central, and those who are partners and friends of Mission Central, are the reason for hope that this world has. Thanks be to God for you. Thanks be to God for the ministry, the Mission Central. God's people, keep hope alive. Let us pray. Oh God, we are honored to be here this evening in celebration of the 11th anniversary of Mission Central. What began as a dream and hope in the mind of Bishop Nilayans, you made possible the fruition of that dream. But that appears to be how you always work, oh God. You place within us the possibilities of what you desire the world to look like. You give us visions and dreams, and then as we step out in faith and dependence upon you, those visions and dreams become realized. For Bishop Islands, and the dream that you placed within him, for the countless other individuals who have worked diligently over these past years to make all of this possible, we are eternally thankful. We thank you as well, our loving God, for persons like Dr. James Jackson, and Mr. Rick Perry, 
who have helped visualize for us what you told Abraham over 4,000 years ago. As he responded to your voice and dream, you will be blessed in order that you might be a blessing. Lord, when we recognize how much you have blessed us, then we begin to realize that blessing is intended to be shared. It is only a blessing when it is given away, such as your love for God, grace given to us, through us, to someone else. May you continue to bless this ministry. Bless the director, the Reverend Robert Fisher, and the president, Marsha Fisher, and all of the dedicated and committed staff, the board of directors, and the partners and friends of the Mission Central. And continue to inspire dream among us that this vital ministry might continue to fulfill your dream in and through your people. We give you thanks for the meal prepared for us. Bless those who labor for it. Bless our fellowship as you share this privileged dinner table together. Strengthen our body, mind, and soul for the journey ahead as your people. For all of this and so much more, we give you our thanks. In Christ's name, amen. amen. I also would like to thank this evening's sponsors. Uh, tonight, our event sponsor, of course, is Giant Food Corporation, and we thank them and for uh, not only for this evening, but all that uh, Giant Food Corporation does for Mission Central. Uh, some of our other uh, sponsors this evening are the Forklift Sponsor, which is L.B. Smith Estate Foundation, uh, Pallet Sponsor, Century 30, uh, 21 Realty Services, and a Box Sponsor, Bishop and Mrs. Park. Uh, we are also grateful this evening for our table sponsors and our event supporters, all of which are listed in your program this evening. Uh, this evening would not be possible without a very special group of folks, and that's our Gala Steering Committee, uh, chaired by uh, Thomas, Susan Thomas. Uh, many folks made this evening possible, uh, the facility for work here and uh, at Mission Central. I want to extend thanks to our board of directors. Well, of course, my staff, I couldn't do it without my staff, but there's one special person on my staff, my executive assistant, who really makes my job possible. Where is she? I'm looking and I've seen pointing. But Deb, wherever you are, would you just please, there you are, please stand. <laughs> she was the keystone of this whole operation, so I, I thank Deb for her work there. Um, and of course, this evening, our technical support is uh, brought to us by Jerry Ruth Wolfmuth, and I appreciate Jerry's and his work with the sound and uh, photography, or the uh, programming. But also our photographer this evening uh, from Time Passages Photography. I'd like to thank uh, Time Passages uh, Photography for their efforts this evening as well. So thank everyone.
whether whatever their need may be, making those connections uh, to help transform their lives, as well as those of us that participate, uh, our lives are transformed as well. So I again thank you for your generous support and thank you for being with us this evening. I'd like to introduce uh, our board president, uh, Mrs. Marcia Bishop. Uh, she's the board of directors president and uh, she's gonna come and give you a few words as well. Thank you. Welcome. Good to see everyone here tonight, and I hope you appreciate the elegance for the warehouse, and this is a beautiful place to have our second gala, and I'm so glad that you've had the opportunity to be with us tonight. Some of our remarks you'll, you will have heard from Rob, but I think it's important to reiterate them. One of them is uh, the fact that we invited you here this evening not only to celebrate, but to be informed and to uh, ask you to spread the news of what Mission Central is all about. Because Mission Central was a dream of Bishop Irons. And one of the main things to know is that Mission Central was really originated and came into fruition through the United Methodist Church's support. But it's important for you to know that it is ecumenical. And uh, many of us go out and speak to the community, and it can be Lutherans, it can be uh, Episcopalians, it can be all walks of our Christian faith journey. And I'm proud of that fact that it is an ecumenical movement. And as Bishop, as um, Rob said, uh, last year, in 2012, we distributed or shipped over $10 million worth of resources. Now, the resources were not bought by Mission Central, but they were welcomed by Mission Central from the community. People would bring computers in that were refurbished, and they've now gone to India or uh, Tanzania or many other outreaches. We have resources such as hospital beds that have come into us and Project Cure received them with open hands and arms and they went to uh, India. So these are the kind of things that's important for you to know about and when you're uh, in your social settings, you can share that with people so that they know that there is a place of welcome resources. I tell people that Mission Central is like opening a bag of potato chips and trying to only eat one. It becomes very contagious. And I invite you this evening to receive the invitation. You have received it. You are here. Now, the next step of the journey is for you to pass it on so that we can envision how to help more people in the world both locally, nationally, and very much internationally. We accept the challenge and we invite you to do the same. Enjoy your evening. Thank you. Next, I'm gonna call on Mike Ogden, the Facilities Committee Chairperson, to introduce the next part of the program. Mike is a retired Army engineer and a member of First United Methodist Church in Mechanicsburg. He will present a friend who is a great supporter of Mission Center. Please welcome my Well, he's got notes up here and everything. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mike Hong. Greetings from First Church in Mechanicsburg. Uh, when Rob called me oh, uh, about two weeks ago, I guess, and asked me to, uh, to introduce Rick, I, uh, I hesitated for, oh, about this long. Uh, I've known Rick for how long, Rick? Uh, 20 years, I guess. Uh, I knew Rick before I knew he was working for Giant. Uh, I knew him because, well, we played baseball together, softball, we played basketball together. Uh, then I got to know his wife and his family. Uh, Pat, would you stand up? I mean, I know we're honoring Rick, but I'm going to just ask you and Christine. You, you guys aren't getting out of it either. Christine, Elizabeth, uh, Matt, Josh, will you guys stand up for me, please? These are the Herrings. I 
going to joke, not with Rick, but with Patty, that the, the, I tease her a lot. I'm not going to tease you at all. I, I, I promised Patty for Lent I would not tease her at all. Uh, and, I, and I was faithful to that, Rick. I, I really was, okay? But Lent's over, Patty. You know? uh, seriously, I, I, when I, I thought about what I wanted to say about Rick to introduce him, Rick, would you come on, just come on up if you don't mind, because you're going to get to speak up here in a minute anyhow. Uh, and I struggled just ever so slightly with, you know, with one word that I could find to, to uh, describe Rick. Uh, words like balance, commitment, but faithful was one I came up with, actually. Uh, Rick balances a lot of things. His family, he's, uh, he's dedicated to his family, to his wife, his kids. He's dedicated to his sports teams. I'm, I'm a Pirates and a Steelers guy, but I, but I honor Rick's commitment to the Phillies and the Eagles. How many Super Bowls do they have? Uh, uh, no, I'm sorry. I said I wasn't going to do that. But anyhow, uh, this is an opportunity to uh, to kind of let Rick uh, be honored a little bit in, in his role as uh, the president of Giant Foods. I'll let you read about Rick. Uh, what's in the program? I couldn't say it any better than what, what's said there. Other than uh, to Rick Redondo, so Black, thank you for being a great ambassador for Mission Central and for Giant Foods. With friends like Mike, you know how rough it is. You know, so, uh, thank you, Mike. Those are really kind words. Um, we've uh, we've known Mike and uh, me, uh, 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 Mike and Nadine Ogden for uh, well over 20 years. And they also have four children. So I remember when they had their four children. I was like, yeah, four children. And here we are with with four uh, four wonderful children. Um, but but thank you, you know. And tonight we're honoring Giant Foods for uh, for all that all that Giant has been able to do uh, over the past uh, four years. Um, before I do that, though, you know, I just want to again thank all of you for coming and supporting uh, Mission Central. I know there's several thank yous tonight, uh, but it's such a wonderful place, and the work they do is just outstanding. And uh, and that's kind of why Giant became involved with with Mission Central. Um, you know, God is good, and all the time, absolutely, and, and God is love, and, uh, you know, God asks us to spread his love, you know, part of the message getting out is by showing other people through ourselves the love that God provides. Um, I've been blessed uh, myself uh, with, with a great family that was introduced, my wife, Patty, um, you know, she is, she is the key to my life, she's the key to all the things that I am, uh, she keeps me organized. She, uh, uh, tonight she's in a red dress and she said, Rick, you know, she also is my fashion person. Uh, she said, wear, wear a red tie. So <laughs> I happen to have a Phillies tie hanging in my closet, believe it or not. But the way the Phillies are playing right now, I, I, just, I just couldn't do it. <laughs> but uh, as Mike said, you know, we, we go to church together. There are, there are many members of, of our church family that are here. Uh, tonight we have a wonderful church, and, and it is a family. Our family is connected to that church family. Uh, one story I remember, and Pastor Payam is here, uh, but I remember Pastor Payam would do a children's service like you would see in other other church services, and had the kids up front, and two or three of our children were up there, and he held up something. He said, "Do you know what this is?" And and one of the one of the kids said, "That's a potato," and he said, "That's right," and he says. Do you know where potatoes come from? And my daughter, Christina, not quite sure, raises her hand and said, Christina, and she said, giant? <laughs> Since that time, we've been, you know, uh, we, we celebrate that. I'm sorry, Christina. It, it is a true story. But, you know, in addition to, you know, the love of God, a wonderful wife, and a wonderful family, um, I've been blessed to have been with a wonderful company. And many of many of my friends from, from our company are, are here. And, uh, you know, Giant, uh, you know, we, we, I think we operate like a family. I mean, we have our tough days and our, and our good days, but uh, we try and, and, and keep it as much as we can that way. And, you know, another reason that you know, Giant has been so important to me is when I first came to Giant, way back 24 years ago, 1989, um, it always had a hard forgiving. And, you know, back then, it was the United Way. Uh, we, we 
still today run a, a company-wide 33,000 associates, 199 stores. We run a company-wide campaign that most of the people in our company participate in. And, and so that was, the, that was my introduction to Giant and the philanthropy that came out of, came out of Giant. Along with that, we support uh, cancer research. Uh, we do work with the Children's Miracle Network. Uh, we support the food business, so we support the food banks uh, in the areas that we operate. And it's, it's really something that we try and involve our associates with as well. And, and if you visit our stores, you know we have bag hunger campaigns, we involve them. Uh, the community gives to some of the programs that we have. Uh, so we've been very blessed to be able to give back to the communities that we serve. In, in 2010, uh, we, and I knew about Mission Central because of my involvement with, with our church. Uh, Mission Central started in 2002. But in 2010, uh, a unique opportunity happened for, for Giant Foods. Um, we acquired 25 stores in the Richmond market. And um, when you do an acquisition like that, uh, and we were changing over the product in those stores to the product that we carry in Giant. But, so there's a, lot of, there's a lot of things that are left over. And we knew pretty much what to do with food. A lot of it we would go to, to food banks and so forth. But it was the other things in the store that we sell that are non-food items, detergents, soaps, bags, brushes, things like that, that we normally don't carry in our range of products. And we needed to have a place other than throwing it away to go to, and Mission Central came to mind. With the work of, of, uh, of uh, our folks, some that are in this room, we decided it would be great to be able to deliver that to, to an organization that could turn around and put it to great use. And so that really began our relationship in a big way with, with Mission Central. And you know, when you hear about some of the work, and there's a brochure on your table that talks about the work that's done at Mission Central, um, you know, we're blessed to be able to not throw this stuff away, to be able to participate as a partner with Mission Central, and to put, put things to good use that otherwise would not, would not get into the hands of people that need them. Rob talked about it's about, you know, meeting, uh, getting God's resources and meeting human needs. And so uh, with the partnership with Mission Central, uh, we're glad to be able to do that. Uh, since, that, since that time, uh, we've also partnered with uh, Mission Central supporting events uh, like this uh, and some other things that they do uh, around the Mission Central warehouse. And we also last year acquired 15 stores, which again gave us another opportunity to turn a lot of that product into helpful things for, for uh, flood buckets and for birth kits and for other things that Mission Central provides locally to uh, devastated areas from disaster and also globally, and as, as Rob touched on. So, you know, the blessing of giving, and remember God is love, and giving is giving that love to others. That's a blessing that, that we're so fortunate to have uh, through Mission Central. So, you know, uh, congratulations to Mission Central, congratulations for a great evening, and uh, we're, we're really proud to be a part of it with you. So, thank you, thank you everybody, very, very, have a very good night. Thank you very much, Rick. I'll see you afterwards and get some uh, points on bonus cards. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Thank you very much. John, you do a great job. I'm serious with you. You need some points. We'll talk about <laughs> Now, all of us here are aware of what happened this past uh, October and November with the Superstorm Sandy that, that really hit the East Coast. And Mission Central quickly responded with a surge of enormous assistance through fantastic volunteers, goods, and money. And this is how I became involved with Mission Central personally. And it, and it, it was just amazing to me to see how this all came about. Uh, after the storm at ABC 27, we wanted to, to do something to, to help. We, we anticipated uh, that, that this area would get hit really hard. I was one of those reporters, had my raincoat on, standing outside when the storm hit, telling everybody outside, guess what, it's raining. <laughs> after, after it was over, fortunately, a lot of this area did not get the damage that many of our neighbors to the east of us uh, in the north died. So we wanted to do something to help. So we just had an idea. What could we do? So we reached out to Mission Central, and I had heard, heard of you guys before, 
but I wasn't exactly 100% sure what she did. I had this big warehouse, but I really wasn't sure what was inside. Mission Central, and they immediately said yes. They were like, whatever you guys want to do, come out, we'll help you 100%. And that's exactly what they did. What, what we came up with was a program that we called Operation Standing Release. And over the period of just a couple of weeks, uh, I, I traveled to New Jersey, and we did several stories almost every single day about how people here could help. So it started off with flood buckets. And that was the very first story in the Mission Central where there were volunteers there, and they were putting together flood buckets. And watching that just for myself, I was just wondering how how could this help people? But then went down to New Jersey and saw how it could help people. So what we did at the station and what we did through Mission Central was we put out the call and we asked people in the community to donate. And we asked them to donate new items. And we asked them to donate all sorts of different things. And when this came, when this story came about, and I was thinking about it, and I, and I already and I already knew that people in this area were very generous, but I had no idea just how generous people in this area could be until I got involved with the story. Mission Central you know, has that huge warehouse, and we every day we were just campaigning for people to give, and people just showed up in droves, and they just kept coming. They were filling up boxes and they put together their own things to, at, in their own communities and brought them in to where Mission Central was in Mechanicsburg. We had people from far away in Juliana County driving in. <clears throat> they heard our story. They wanted to do something to help. And it was just amazing to see the level of generosity that people give when, you, when they put their mind to it. When all we had to do was just ask. And they came. And Mission Central was such a huge part. They had so many volunteers who were there to pick up the donations and to help with everything that came in. And, and when, you, when you think about helping, especially when I was thinking about it, you don't, you don't think about all that goes into helping. You think, okay, well, I can just donate this and drop it off. But it takes so many volunteers to know what to do with that item that you dropped off. Where does it go? Where, how is it stored? And that's what Mission Central does so very well. So I don't want to keep, I don't want to stay here and keep talking to you about what you probably already know, but I did just want to share that what my personal experience is with Mission Central. So I am honored to be here tonight, and I'm very honored to have been a part of this wonderful program that we were able to put together. And I do want to share with you a clip of, uh, this is one of the stories that I put together. This was at the very end. So we went to New Jersey, we, 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 we collected donations, and then we, took, we loaded them up in trucks and we took it down to New Jersey. And take a look for yourself to see how it all turned out. Some hurricane victims in New Jersey also have a little more to be thankful for this Thanksgiving. Thanks to Midstaters who took part in our Operation Sandy Relief campaign, we asked and you answered. All month, you donated brand new coats, blankets, diapers, toys, and so much more. Now your generosity is really making a difference. James Crummel has more from Atlantic City. Volunteers at Mission Central in Mechanicsburg are dealing with precious cargo. Items you donated to help victims of Hurricane Sandy. You gave so much, it was too much for this 53-foot tractor trailer. Another truck had to be brought in. Now, after days of giving, it was finally time to take these donations to the people who need them. So here we are now at Venice Park United Methodist Church in Atlantic City. We're here, and now all we're doing is waiting for that truck. After seeing the giant tractor trailer make its way down the tiny street, people here were overjoyed and a bit overwhelmed. Unlike Mission Central, there are no forklifts here. Everything has to go by hand. And then you start with the first room and just order the, okay. the second room and we'll stuff that. We can do a bucket for great because I don't think most yeah. of these are very heavy. Okay. Instead of having people running into each other. After a quick prayer. But as we carry each box, Lord, let us know that this is going to help someone in need who right now has nothing. Amen. Let's get started. The volunteers begin the long process of unloading the truck. Oh, my God. Oh, what a blessing. It, that is truly a blessing to see the people open their hearts 
to give so much to the people down here. There are neighbors, yeah, it's, it's heartwarming. That's, that's what our country is all about, right? Even strangers stopped to lend a hand. In less than two hours, everything was off the truck and in the church, all 40,000 pounds. We can't thank you enough, and there are not enough words to explain or exclaim our joy and happiness for what you have done for us. Pastor Clifford Still says they'll probably get everything handed out by the end of the week. That's how great the need is. It um, is definitely uh, sad that it will be going that quick, but it's also good that it's here to go. Elizabeth Austin lost nearly everything. She says the little things, like cleaning supplies, are a big help. It mean a lot. It saved me a lot of money, too. Money that I don't have. This is the only coat that she had left. As you see, it has no arms in it, and it's very thin. Carrie Duncan is here with his five-year-old daughter, Manasia. Most of her clothes were ruined when her bedroom flooded. Because of you, she now has a new warm coat. It take a lot of stress off me, you know, because I hate to see it go out like this in the morning. And now I'm happy, you know, and, I, and I'm, I'm thankful for all the donations that's coming on all over the world. I'm, I'm so grateful, and it's been wonderful. People pulled together, and it's so wonderful how they pulled together when a disaster happened. You know, it's, it's just a blessing. Blessings is a word we heard a lot throughout this day. While watching Thank these you. people find reasons to smile, you may want to take time to count yours. We've just today been blessed from Harrisburg, from Mission Central. What do you say? Thank you. All of these items will continue to be given out to the people who need them, as well as these supplies. You also donated more than $30,000 in cash to help the victims of the storm. And we want to thank everyone who helped make Operation Sandy Relief possible. But most of all, we want to thank those of you who decided to give. In Atlantic City, New Jersey, James Crummel, ABC 27 News.
And so like that little girl in the video who only had one jacket, many families had absolutely nothing left except for what was on their backs. And so we were able to go out and hand out things. And I have to have an honest moment with you. I, I was carrying a flood bucket. And my wife and I were, were driving up and down the streets and we were handing them out. And, and I had that moment where I thought, really? One five-gallon bucket with some cleaning supplies? Like, these people have lost everything. And then my son and I were walking down the street and we were handing them out door to door. And a gentleman came to the door and he came right out to the door and he just grabbed me. He gave me the biggest hug I think I've ever had. And he started to cry. And he said, it just helps to know that somebody cares. I'm not alone in this. And he thanked me for the flood bucket. And I thought, you know, that's what Mission Central is all about. Yes, your donations are wonderful. Yes, the products do go to good use. Yes, they're wearing your clothes you donated. They were being warmed by the heaters that you sent us. They're using the dehumidifier to try and get their homes back in shape. But at the same time, you spread God's love. You share his word. And you've let people know that they're not alone. In the pictures that were uh, flashing before you as you were eating dinner, you got to see some of the things that I experienced and my church experienced. We had tractor trailer loads coming to my church. And I actually had someone earlier say to me, oh, we got to see pictures of your warehouse. I said, no, that's my fellowship hall. <laughs> and sanctuary, and Sunday school rooms. We packed it all in. But because we had so many activities going on in our church, we had to empty it right away. And so our volunteers just backed their cars up and backed their pickup trucks right up to the door, and, and we got the stuff out to where it was needed. Through our association with Mission Central, we've had more people call us to say, I hear you're taking donations. And so just in a few short weeks following the hurricane, we took seven tractor trailer loads of product into our church. People who called and said, now you're associated with Mission Central, right? You're a hub, right? You'll take these products. And we said, absolutely. We say no to anything. And we took literally everything into our church. But since then, it has continued, and it has really grown. People are willing to volunteer. They're willing to look forward to the next phase of recovery. We're looking into rebuilding. We now have homes that need to be repaired. We still have 800 people that are in temporary housing, if you can imagine. We have families that are still living in one-room motel rooms because their homes were destroyed. And we still we have families that are moving back. And they're pulling their lives back together, and the communities are starting to, starting to fellowship together, and they're starting to grow. At the end of the photograph that you had seen, you might have noticed some pictures of some new things. Sofas, appliances. Those were things that we were able to purchase because of your monetary donation. We partnered with different uh, companies and different retailers, and they helped us get things that people needed to get back on their feet. So we not only gave out flood buckets, but we gave out sofas. We gave out refrigerators, heaters, and most of all, we gave out God's love, all because of you. So while I and my church have sat where you are sitting, asking people to, to sponsor and to join and to, to volunteer, I'm here tonight to tell you that being on the other end of that receiving truck is worth everything that you can possibly imagine you have done to help Mission Central. We are very proud to be a hub, and we tell everyone we know that we are a hub of Mission Central, and that we're proud of the work that's happening all around the globe. But you know, Rob said it earlier when he described Mission Central, he said it is global, and it's very global. It took us two hours and 45 minutes to drive here today. That's local. And those people, every time I see them, want me to tell you thank you from the bottom of their hearts and that all you have done has changed their lives. So I ask that you continue to support Mission Central. Make it a priority in your charity giving. Make it something that you can proudly tell your neighbors, your friends, people in your church, all sorts of ways to get involved. And that the people
people on the other end of that truck really do appreciate all that you are doing. Thank you. God bless you. Regarding the work of our next honoree. Time now for our Making a Difference report. Tonight, it's about things most of us take for granted at hospitals here in the United States. No matter what you think about health care, think of this clean syringes, sterile dressings in the operating room, basic heart monitoring equipment, proper surroundings and materials. All of it's so common here. We often have too much of it in the U.S. That's where a project saving lives on the other side of the world comes in. Our report tonight from NBC's Michael Oku. From an Ethiopian slum, this is the smile a little girl gives when she's been given a second chance to live. Five-year-old Tequemesh Awai was born with a heart defect, a pulmonary artery so narrow it obstructed normal blood flow. She didn't eat or sleep, her mother says. She was awfully sick. The condition kills thousands of children here every year. But doctors saved Tequemesh with the help of Ethiopia's only cardiac catheterization lab for children, a gift from an organization half a world away in a Denver suburb. When I first started Project Cure, you can imagine my learning curve. It's where Jim Jackson founded Project Cure, a nonprofit that collects surplus medical supplies from hospitals and then sorts, tests, and ships those supplies to the poorest clinics and hospitals worldwide. Scrubs for Kenya, scanners for Cambodia. Jackson, a former economist, came up with the idea after witnessing squalor at a doctor's clinic in the Brazilian highlands. So he promised he'd return with donated supplies, and he delivered. The director of the hospital um, said to me, you know what you really brought us? You brought us hope. Since its first shipment in 1987, Project Cure has sent medical supplies to 123 countries. This year alone, it plans on moving $40 million worth to 70 hospitals around the world. All with the help of donations and the time of 10,000 volunteers, including retired ER nurse Millie Truitt. When I touch things, I think, you know, who is this going to touch? Hey. Back in Ethiopia, where checkups now start with life-affirming hugs, doctors estimate the lives of some 2,000 children a year will be saved by that cath lab alone. Now I play. I can do whatever I want, Tequemesh says. A little girl with a smile and a message across seas. Thank you. Michael Oku, NBC News, Centennial, Colorado. Mrs. Jean Doris, a longtime supporter and member of the Board of Directors, will have the honor of presenting this very special friend of Mission Central. It is indeed an honor to be a part of this, to be a part of uh, what Project Cure is doing. And it happened soon after we began, um, after opening our doors. A uh, few boxes and uh, pallets were full of medical supplies. And uh, now we are a big part of what goes on. Project Cure is a big part of what goes on at Mission Central. Um, these unused medical supplies that in the U.S. are discarded in many cases get reused and get sent all over the world. We're absolutely honored tonight to have the founder of Project Cure, Dr. James Jackson, with us and his wife, Dr. Anne Marie Jackson. Dr. Jackson pro, uh, self-proclaims himself as the happiest man in the world. And uh, that's because he went from being a very successful businessman to being a humanitarian. He discovered the joy and the endorphins that are released when we uh, respond to God's call. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. James Jackson.
common folks like you and me. Our builders for eternity. For each is given a bag of tools, a piece of stone, and a book of rules. And each must form ere life is flung a stumbling block or a stepping stone. I want to tell you tonight that I've come to some decisions, I've <laughs> come to some conclusions. And if you want to know how come I'm the happiest guy in the world, I finally figured out that alternatives that are presented to us day after day, day in, day out, ultimately have to make some choices, don't we? Choices set into consequences, into motion consequences. And how we handle those consequences from the choices that we made ourselves determines our level of happiness. You know, Christ himself said, that your concern for others is the measure of your greatness. So I am the happy. You go home and tell your family that tonight at, at Mission Central, uh, you got to see the happiest guy in the world. <laughs> the only thing is I see a lot of competitors here because there are a lot of happy people here for the same reason. We've decided to give the best of our lives for the rest of our lives helping other people be better off. I think that, I think when I'm, when I'm, uh, uh, my mind has an opportunity to just kind of, of uh, relax and my, my uh, VCR player inside of my head <laughs> begins to roll and I realize what God has allowed to happen. Project Cure now is the largest handler of donated medical supplies in the world. And I quit counting after I'd been to 150 different countries. And for about 25 years, uh, I spent the time, uh, maybe 250 days a year. And if you want to see a champion, this is my girlfriend here, bright of 53 years, uh, Dr. Anna Marie Jackson, because I couldn't have done it, obviously. when you encourage each other 
And you see what happens when it begins to multiply and start to take on a life of its own. Pretty exciting, isn't it? So, my encouragement would be, continue to do some more of it. Be brave. Be brave in accepting Christ and the Lordship of His life. And the fact that, you know what? He's in control. And He loves the people we're trying to help even more than we could love them. And that's, that's the partnership that we have. I want to get on to that because, let me just tell you a little bit. We're going to talk about goodness. Um... One of the things that makes me a happy man is because for these, these many years and many roads and many stinky beds to sleep in <laughs> on the ground and, and every place else for, for 150 countries, I am happy. I am proud of the fact that God has allowed me the strength, the opportunity to go and do and be what he wants me to be. And so tonight, um, how many of you, in, in traveling around, have been to some places probably you don't know very much about? How many of you have, have done a destination vacation to Nargoni Carabao? Uh, how many? Yeah, you can find it on the map. <laughs> but did you know, did you know that when they were running this pipeline, everybody knows the stories about trying to get the oil from from the Caspian Sea over to the Black Sea so you could ship it out. Well, that's what the whole Chechnya war was about. They wanted to run it up through Russia, up through Chechnya, the, the new pipeline. And they're saying, no, we don't, we don't trust the Russians. <laughs> we get it up there like it is in Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and, and places. If you're not towing the mark, uh, you, Russia just shuts down the, the natural gas, and there you are in Kazakhstan. And, and, you, and you, you stay cold. And so they didn't want to do that. So they decided they were going to run it through uh, from Baku over to, to up to Tbilisi. But they thought, well, there's a shorter way. We can take it right through Nergona Karabakh, which is an Armenian um, kind of an enclave. Um, but they had a problem. What are we going to do with all the people? So the Russian Fourth Army and the Azerbaijanis and the Turks decided they were going to engulf and circle around and just practice this little cute little thing called genocide. And uh, they killed over 80% of the male population. How many read that? How many of you became experts on, on, on learning what happened in, in um, Nergoni Karabakh? Um, Baroness Caroline Cox, who was the deputy speaker of the House of Lords in London, got a hold of me and she said, Jim, can, can you meet me in, in Yerevan, Armenia? Uh, if, there's a, if there's a hero in this world, in my opinion, if you want to get a book and read it, it's an incredible book, Voice for Voices. Baroness Caroline Cox was a nurse herself. She's the deputy speaker of the House of Lords. Almost single-handedly, she brought that whole Nargona Karabakh massacre and genocide to a halt. Read in her book that she is on the front line and, and and taking Russian helicopters to get the, the victims out. Because when I got there, they were having their, their hospitals, they were doing procedures in caves. Because the mortar shells had already blown up the hospital. Now, we met in Yerevan, Armenia. We took an old Russian helicopter, and we went over no man's land and dropped right down into Stepanik or Marty. And what I saw, I didn't want to believe, I didn't want to see. But we spent 10 days together in, in they're going to care about. At the end of that 10 days, Baroness Cox said, Dr. Jackson, is there any way, and she'd asked me a thousand questions about Project Cure. She said, is there any way we can come to Denver, Colorado, and my assistant, Stuart Windsor, and I can actually come and see what you do? I said, oh yes, please come. Please come to our home. Yes, we'd love to have you. After a time of visiting here, she said, we need to get you in the UK. She said, if you and Doug will come to the UK, I will put on a meeting at the Intercontinental Hotel on Hyde Park, and we will see to it that the contacts are made, because if you get a, like a 501c3 here in, in the US, but every one of the registered charities in the UK has to be approved by Parliament. She said, I'll see to it you get it. We went there. It was incredible. 
and we met an organization called Blythewood Trust in Scotland. I went up to Scotland, met with their board, and, and they said, well, it seems to me, first thing you're going to need here is, a, is some warehouse space. I said, you're perceptive. I don't know anything about warehouse space. Ask Mission Central. And, uh, <laughs> and so they said, well, um, why don't you, when you go back to Heathrow, why don't you get on the train and go out to Rochester? And we, we, will, we will donate you some space um, right where the, the Thames and the Medway River come together. And that's where King Henry used to have his navy before they moved it all up to, to um, uh, London. And, and we will see if we can get you set up in the UK with some warehouse space. So I went there. We landed in Rochester, uh, got off the train, and we felt in love, absolutely fell in love with Rochester. Now, I'll tell you what else we did. We fell in love with, with a guy who was born there, and it was his hometown by the name of Charles Dickens. Now, I decided to go back and reread some of Dickens' stories, and I fell in love with the guy and what he was doing to try to reform stuff, try to wake people up. Well, you can, you can kind of go down the streets, and, and they let us go into his library. I even got to sit down at his desk where he penned a lot of the novels and, and got to spend the whole day there in, in, uh, in Gann Hill. You remember, and I remember, one of, the, one of my favorite stories out of that is, is A Christmas Carol. Did you read it this year? <laughs> I hope you didn't just listen to one on, t on TV. But, but, but The Christmas Carol, and you can see as you, as you walk down through there and then back in London again. You can almost see Dickens' characters coming out of the doorways, you know, and at Covent Garden and selling the flowers and all, all of that stuff. Remember, it was Charles Dickens, and it was come Christmas time, and poor old, poor old um, um, Cratchit, Bob Cratchit, wanted to take off Christmas Day, and and Scrooge is saying, well, I suppose you want, listen, if you take off, what makes you think you need to go take off Christmas Day when I have to, you know, and gave him a tough time. And he said, you be back here early the day after Christmas. And then, of course, you remember the scenes of poor uh, old um, Bob Cratchit trying to make his way home and the whole sad thing of Tiny Tim and, and all of that. And, and But remember, Remember, as, as uh, uh, Scrooge was heading back, got some Pope Grub, went on down, and, and put the key in the lock of the house that used to belong to his ex-partner, Jacob Marley. Seven years Jacob Marley had been dead. As he put the key into the lock, the door knocker, remember, <laughs> became the head of uh, of, his old, old, of his old partner, uh, uh, Jacob Marley, scared the absolute pudding out of, out of Scrooge. He, would, he unlocked it and was, and, and was afraid he was going to look around and see uh, Jacob Marley's ponytail, you know, and, and his whole head on the inside, scared him to death, made his way up that wide, winding stairway, and triple locked his way into where he, in his sleeping quarters looked under the bed, looked in all the rooms, sat down with his little bit of porridge in front of that one piece of burning coal. You see, remember the scenes? <laughs> but he hears a sound, what sounded like chains rattling over the wine cask down in the basement. And it comes closer, and it comes closer. Alexander's Pretty soon, he hears it come closer, and actually, Jacob Marley, it goes for him, comes right through the wall, right through the door, and 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 poor old Scrooge is, is saying, "Is this really you? Is this really you, Jacob Marley? What have, what has brought you here to me? Why are you here tormenting me?" Jacob Marley said, "Scrooge, I come here at a high price, but I'm here to tell you that you still have a chance." You see these chains that I'm the one that forged, link by link, link by link, and I'm dragging now? 
He said, I'm here to try to keep you from going through what I'm going through. I am, I am assigned now to go around and to see the things I could have helped, the people I could have helped in my lifetime, but I didn't. Now I see them and I can't. And he said, remember told him about the, the three visitors he'd have, Christmas past, Christmas present, Christmas future. At the end of that, when he was, he was talking, finally, finally, Scrooge just said, look, back off a little bit. <laughs> uh, uh, ease up on me. Jacob Marley, you were a wonderful businessman. You, you, were, you were great. You made a lot. You made a lot. We were good partners. And he said, you were, you were good at business. And Jacob Marley said, business? Mankind was my business. Common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance, benevolence were all my business. And the dealings of my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of my business. Whoa, you remember the story that happened? And, and, and the good ending that came out of that, of course, was after the, after the Christmas past, Christmas present, Christmas, and Christmas future, and, and, and uh, Scrooge is asking, does this really have to happen and end this way? Or is it a possibility, remember, he draped over his own, his own tombstone, said, is there a possibility that, that this could change? The good news is it did change. And instead of, instead of uh, uh, old Scrooge retiring, he simply rewired. And he had the opportunity to, to rewire his motherboard of his own personal computer. He got the circuit board of his life's purpose, finally figured out, straightened out. And it says that he became one of the most generous guys in London, a second father to a little tiny Tim. Now, humans, humans have a unique capacity to attain through invitation and through development excellence of character. And based on that character, they choose to become involved in initiating attitudes and actions of kindness, generosity, fairness, sympathy, mercy, personal responsibility, virtue, justice, charity, gentleness, forbearance, righteousness, and benevolence. The genuine seeking and promoting and dispensing of such attitudes and behavior are what we're going to call goodness. So instead of me going back through and doing all those descriptors, is it okay if we just refer to it as goodness and, and, and we can get on with this? Okay. Now, for the next few minutes, before we, before we close this out, I want to share with you four hooks that you can hang in your, in, your, in your closet on which to put just some ideas about goodness. We're here tonight to discover and have revealed to us and accept even more goodness in, com in, in, com in conjunction with with um, our work, whether it's here, whether it's in the flood areas, whether it's in Africa, Sierra Leone, wherever we want to go. And I think tonight that I want to present four, four little hooks for you. Number one, the concept of goodness is compelling. Don't you feel it in your heart? Don't you feel the tug? Don't you experience it? 
He said as he's walking down the street with a bucket in his hand? Yes, that's it. The whole concept of goodness is compelling. Um, think with me just for a minute. Get the canvas of your mind clear and let me paint a picture. <laughs> okay. Here I am on the telephone. Because wherever I, wherever I travel on airplanes and everything else, people ask me, well, well, what are you doing, Dr. Jackson? And I begin to tell them about Project Cure. And these guys may be CEOs of huge companies or whatever, and they always say, oh man, when I grow up, I want to do what you do. <laughs> it's compelling. That's why you're going to be successful more and more and more in, in Mission Central. Because what you're doing is the right thing at the right time. It's compelling. Now, get in your mind, here I am on the telephone to what we refer to kind of backhandedly as, as foggy bottom. That's the State Department in Washington, D.C. And, and I, and I love him and I love him and, I, and we work together all around the world. In fact, in fact, the State Department has given to me their highest honor, the, the the Florence Nightingale Award in, in Humanities, and, and we get along great. But can you imagine, here I am on the phone, and I'm saying, hi, this is Dr. Jackson again. I need, to, I need a little bit of help for you to get me um, a visa put in my passport to go to DPRK. And the gal says, what did you say? Uh, I said, I got an invitation to come to North Korea. I need, I need some help to get going. You what? <laughs> I said, I have a personal invitation from Great Leader Kim Il Sung to come to, to Pyongyang. No, you don't. I said, yeah, I do. No, you don't. You're lying. Nobody has that. Other people have said they had it, but, they, but no. And, and besides that, there's only one place you can get your visa. You have to go to Beijing, and you have to go to the North Korean embassy. And I'll tell you this, that when you go, you'll not get it. And you've just wasted your money to go to Beijing. I said, okay. No, you don't understand. We don't have any operatives in, in DPRK. Nobody does. The Swiss don't. There are, it's the most closed permit country in the world, and you're not going there. We're here to keep people like you from causing international incidents. And I go, well, I think I should go. <laughs> well, that was, that was June. I never heard from him until about Thanksgiving. And uh, I got a call from the State Department. They said, well, Dr. Jackson, we've added you out. Indeed, indeed, you do have a personal invitation from Great Leader Kim Il Sung to come and celebrate his 81st birthday in Pyongyang. I said, yeah. <laughs> they said, well, we believe, we have reason to believe that all they're, doing, all they're going to do is get you there and hold you hostage. I said, okay. Well, this one. <laughs> and finally, cut the story short, I went to Pyongyang. And I got to uh, Beijing, and I, gave, I was staying in the Swiss hotel. I, I gave the concierge my, uh, uh, some instruction. He gave it, he translated it and, and to a, a Chinese for a cab, to take me over to the North Korean embassy. And I walked in, and they had all my paperwork ready. They had the tickets. They said, well, there are only two flights uh, a week that go from Beijing into Pyongyang. And it's on Tuesday and Saturday. Tomorrow Saturday, you be out there, and we'll find you. Said, oh, okay. <laughs> so we got on the airplane, and as as we were circling the field, like you see on on, on TV these days, you know, I have all of, of in that big red square area, um, um, all these people, and the military. They were all down there, and um, and as we landed, they don't have they didn't have. Uh, Jetways like we do, um, they lean the kind of a ladder thing up, and the guy with a black suit, black tie, and white shirt came on with two armed guys, on it. and he stood up in front of the in front of the, the cockpit, and he said, "Mr. Jackson, I go, oh no, it didn't take me very long to get in jail here," <laughs> and so he said, "Hey, just follow us." So we went back down, we put me in a personnel carrier, and we went across the tarmac, 
and right in front of these of all these people. And they were waving live azalea plants and began singing. They gave me a hero's welcome. I was the first one to get in, to ever come and, 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 and help them. Well, that set an interesting, that set an interesting uh, uh, format for future. Uh, I've had the opportunity to, to return to DPRK now eight times. And I just want to share with you, and in, in order to keep me in tra on track so I don't get so much information in that <laughs> detail. Let, let me just let me just read to you uh, uh, out of the Happiest Man book. Uh, on my fourth trip back to DPRK, I had a very rewarding experience. The different leaders enjoyed taking turns hosting me upon my return to Pyongyang. I had become good friends with the Minister of Health, Dr. Choi Chan Sik, and it was his turn to have me come to his department and welcome me. His offices were formal and elegant with plush chairs, hand-woven carpets, delicate lace furniture coverings. And we sat at separate low-profile hand-carved tables being served in song and ginseng tea. Healthy, huh? Several attendants in the room transcribed every word that was spoken during the entire meetings. And that was the way it was all the every time I ever went there. They had people writing down every word, every word I said. We joked and laughed together at the beginning before the formal protocol took over. And the host always speaks formally first, then the guest is given time to, for a brief response, and the discourse continues back and forth. Mr. Choi Chan Sik clearly spoke, and I knew it was time for the formalities to begin. Mr. Jackson, he said, three more of your large ocean going cargo containers have recently arrived at Nambo Port. And I have personally overseen the distribution of the medical goods in the hospitals and clinics as we agreed. Great Leader Kim Il Sung, dear Leader Kim Jong Il, and all the people of DPRK personally thank you for your kindness. But you are a mystery to us. <laughs> huh. <laughs> and we are somewhat confused. We have recorded every word that you have said while in the DPRK and have filed those words in the grand building of education. That'd be like our Library of Congress. You have given millions of dollars worth of needed medical supplies and equipment to our people. We cannot figure out what it is that you want. We have reviewed your words, and you never give away what it is that you want from us, Mr. Jackson. What is it that you want? I leaned back against the ornate legs of the chair and chuckled. Dr. Choi, I said, smiling, you have asked me a very direct question, and I will answer you with a very direct answer. Had you not asked me directly, I would not have answered you directly. Do you have time for a very small story? Oh, yes, of course I have. Please, go on. When I was a little boy, I determined that I would be a millionaire by the time I was 25 years old. Do you understand what it means to be a millionaire? Oh, yes. My brothers and I worked very hard and tried to learn as much as possible about becoming rich. By the time I was 30 years old, I had become 16 times wealthier than I ever dreamed I would be in all my life. But no one ever told me that accumulating wealth wouldn't necessarily make me a happy man. And I was not a happy man. My wife and I talked about it and asked each other the question, just when was it when we were happy in our life? We agreed that it was during the time when we had no money, but we only had love and good health and a dream. So we decided to give all our wealth away and start over again. So, we decided to give our wealth away, and I asked God to forgive me for being such a selfish man. Now, Dr. Park, you know who I'm talking to. <laughs> I asked God to forgive me for being such a selfish man, and I promised that from that time on, I would spend all of my energy and all of my time helping other people be better off. God answered my prayer answered my prayer and changed the mainspring of my ticking clock 
of my life. I became a different person than before. You now ask me directly what it is that I want from you. The answer is, I want nothing in return from you, for any good thing I have done or ever will do. I have given you these medical supplies and to your people because I love you. And I will never ask anything from you in return. The Minister of Health is totally stunned. As he sat looking at me, he then lowered his cup of tea down to the ornately carved table and stood up. When he stood up, I stood up. I was culturally aware enough to know that Asians do not touch others in public. This is all. But as Dr. Choi came over to where I was standing, he approached me and opened his arms. I'll never forget it. He said to me, I was educated to hate you. And I was trained to kill you. And I would have. But you have come in love to us. And he reached out and grabbed me in a big bear hug. And he said, you are my brother, and I love you. And I thought, oh, oh, Lord, we have something pretty powerful over here. You see, goodness, the concept of goodness is compelling. Number two, the longing for goodness is universal. Uh, that's how often you stay on track. <laughs> so you could be here till four o'clock this morning. I'll read this from, from the, our latest book out called Love and Common Sense. It's 70 short stories. Because when I, when I published the first book, um, The Happiest Man, kind of tells the story project. And then everybody came back and said, Well, we want more stories, more stories. <laughs> so these are these are 70 short stories from around the world to challenge your mind and ignite your compassion. Outside the airport terminal, Dr. Horner was waiting to pick me up. Our destination was San Juan Pico, El Salvador. The jungle paradise had just come through a difficult 12 years of civil war. Dr. Horner was quick to explain to me about one of the hazards of living in El Salvador. The unemployed men have become bandits. Then he pointed out the 212 bullet holes in the car in which we were riding. <laughs> Dr. Horner promised that as long as I stayed with him, he, I, I, he tried to stay away from any roads where the bandits were hanging out. And I was in El Salvador to inspect the new Clinica La Esperanza facility that the Project Cure had completely furnished with medical goods, as well as determine how we would partner in other hospitals and clinics in the region. It was a very rewarding thing for me to see all the medical goods being moved from the new to the new clinic and being set up, and all those items at once were in the warehouse. We drove to a village, and it was a typical invasion city, like those I've seen in Haiti and Colombia and Peru and other places, and the ragged refugees had gathered bits of cardboard and tin and wood and built crude shelters. They had no water supply, no sewer, no electricity, no sanitary or any security. And Dr. Horner wanted to introduce me to some of the destitute families that were going to be trying to serve in the Shanty Village. There were mothers with babies balanced on their hips, and children with tattered clothes, and toothless old men with worn out shoes who came to meet me. Dr. Horner was especially eager for me to meet one of the families that he was helping, and he had just recently been able to gather some wooden posts and a few pieces of sheet metal for roof to protect Maria's little family from the rain. Maria and her husband and her children had lived once lived on their little farm in the mountains. One day a marauding military band came to their farm and demanded that all the eggs and milk and they wanted them to feed the troops. Later, the men returned and demanded the chickens and the goats to slaughter and to eat. 
And once again, the soldiers returned, put a gun to the head of Maria's husband, and demanded that he join the insurgency group with them. When he refused, the soldiers lined up the family in front of their own humble house and shot the husband in cold blood, and as the children watched in terror. Then they told Maria and the children to leave. They would return by Friday, and if the family was still there, they too would be murdered, and Maria gathered the children and fled to San Juan del Pico for refuge. By the time Dr. Horner had found her, her children were literally starving to death. She had only one single cucumber for them to eat in the two previous days. Dr. Horner gathered food and took it to the tree where Maria was living. And he made about three trips taking food to Maria. Then one morning around 4 o'clock, a man slipped into the space where Maria and the three children slept and put a sharp knife to her throat. He told her that he was taking all of her food and demanded all the other food that would be delivered to her in the future. She was warned that if she mentioned it, what happened to anyone or did not comply, he would return unexpectedly at night and slit the throats of the children one at a time, and last of all, he'd kill her. He told her his family, his family, had been there longer than she had been there and deserved the food, and he would provide for his hungry children even if it meant killing her. Dr. Hearn Horner never returned to Maria's shanty to deliver the food. Rather, he had the oldest boy who had now become uh, a student at the orphanage school take small supplies of food home each day in the school backpack. I went with Dr. Horner to meet the brave young mother. He told her about me and the medical clinic that would be available to her children for good health care. Maria's eyes filled with tears. Why? Why would this man come all the way from the United States to help us? And she stood for a moment, overwhelmed, then making a sweeping hand motion over her little family and touching each of the kids. She reached back at me, looked at me, and then leaped and wrapped her arms small arms around me, sobbing as she buried her face in my white shirt. I held her momentarily. Then as Dr. Horner and I walked away, I looked down at my tear-soaked shirt. I don't want those tears to evaporate or disappear. I wanted to wear them as a badge of love. I prayed that somehow God would dispatch a small band of angels to care for and protect this little widow who had seen more of her own life than I would ever experience. Oh, the feeling, the feeling of wanting and experiencing the goodness. Everyone wants that feeling. So not only is the concept of goodness compelling, but the longing for goodness is universal. Thirdly, quickly, the results of goodness are forever. I had the ambassador from, uh, um, well, he was, in, he was in New York at that, at that time, but I came down and said to us, um, we would like to have you come to, to, to Nigeria. And he said, we have enough money we can actually build our new teaching hospital. So Dr. Jackson, we don't have any, any way to put anything into that hospital. Would Project Cure, if we build the hospital, would Project Cure come and fill it up? And so I went there, did the needs assessment, I said, yes, we'll, we'll join in. And I think it was about $17 million that we finally ended up pumping into that, that teaching hospital. I went there the, when, they, when they called me and they said, come, it's, it's time to, to dedicate this hospital. The president of Nigeria was there. Almost all of the all of the tribal chiefs uh, were there, and and before before the dedication started, they 
they took me in a car and let me let me go through the hospital um, all by myself to take a look. I was I was overwhelmed. I can't. I, I'm not ashamed to tell you, as I walked through that hospital and saw in the operating theater the lights overhead, taking the, the operating theater, the anesthesia machines, everything in the regular beds and the, and, the, and the tables over the bed. Everything that was in that hospital had been in, in the warehouse, someplace around the United States. I started crying. I thought, oh my goodness, not only is, is this goodness, all of these other things, but they, the results go on forever. Think how many people are going to be trained in the hospital, not just the people who are immediately uh, made well, but they train and then they go on out to other countries, other places in, 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 in Africa. It goes on. What you are doing at Mission Central will not stop. It will lap up against the shores of eternity. It doesn't stop. What you're doing goes on forever. Lastly, the need for goodness is now. I got a request from Africa, South Africa, just out of Johannesburg, a little place called Albertown. And it was interesting because when the request for assistance came through, um, it was um, um, signed by a guy by named Philip and his wife Vivian, and he had been um, a legislator in Albertown, just out of, out of Johannesburg. Now, our town had been taken over by refugees. There was over a million people in this refugee camp, a shanty town, uh, in our town. And he said, my wife and I have dedicated ourselves to build a hospice. And when I saw that, I thought, oh, yes, i got I got to pursue this. Because we had been involved in, in hospice building in, in Romania, and the, and the reason was, for example, if I go to a hospital in, in a company, say Compassi or, or Chikachi or Kinshasa or someplace, every hospital bed in every ward is full of an AIDS person. They're not going to leave the hospital. Now, they don't say they died from AIDS, they died from something else. Uh, um, the angel of death came and took them. Usually means another disease, and so I have been there. And and, and for these people to say what well, we want to do is build a, uh, a hospice, I'm going. Oh, that's that. If we can encourage them, because that gets them out of those hospitals. So what do you do if you have a have a, a ten car automobile accident and all your beds are already full and they already took all of the supplies and, and, and what do you do? So let's see if we can figure out to clear out the hospital rooms. So we can do what a hospital and, and get so and put them in a home where they, there can be family reconciliation again before the death place takes place. In. And so I, I told the office, I said, uh, schedule that in, let's see if we can work that in one of our next trips right away. We got to our town and Anna Marie and I stayed in that hospice for five nights. I wanted to see what was going on. And it broke my heart. Um, Vivian and Philip would actually take those those AIDS people who were in, in the dying stage. Nobody total rejection. They would pick those people up, put them in a bathtub, and wash them, and then the next morning we'd take them out. No wheelchairs, nothing. Put them on the back, carry them out, put them on on the, in, the, in the sun, let them let them uh, get some fresh air. And I'm, I'm having a little tough time dealing with that. Uh, I see more, more tragedy and heartbreak in 30 days than most people do in their entire life. And this was tough. One night, uh, there, was, there was one lady who, who, who died a very, very tragic death. She was, and, before, and before she died, she called us and made us promise that we would go back to the shantytown and try to find her two children, Michael and Brenda. And she said, when you find them, 
And so Vivian and Philip agreed, and we all went out the next day with the directions to go down this trail and this place over here and find find the little uh, shanty uh, made out of out of, out of uh, wood and stuff. And said, uh, so when we got to the place, there was a padlock on a big chain, and and we said, where are the children of the city? And they said, an old woman is taking care of them and gave us the address. So we went there, and sure enough, and these are just blankets as walls and, and, and dirt floors and stuff. And the woman came and, and we talked to her, and Philip said, do you know where, where Michael and Brenda are? And then, they kind of took a little time out and caught us up on the story. The lady who had just died in the hospice uh, had AIDS. Her husband had had AIDS and he died. Then she took a boyfriend. And he now had AIDS and had run off to, to um, Johannesburg. In Africa, 80% of the male population really believes that if you have a sexually transmitted disease that you can get cured by having intercourse with a virgin. Now the tougher you have, the, the more, the, the, the more um, uh, complicated the disease, uh, the younger the virgin. So it's not unusual. It's one of the tragedies of Africa that's taking place right now. Uh, Twelve-year-old, eleven-year-old girls being being with, with the AIDS virus pass on. Brenda was five years old. The boyfriend had started raping her at five. Passed on uh, HIV. Brenda came to the door. Michael came to the door. The old woman said, we will keep Michael. I will keep Michael. I don't want to keep Brenda. I don't want to keep Brenda. She's dying. When we walked away from there, I remember looking back and seeing Brenda. What do I do? Look, <laughs> I thought, the time for goodness is not next Tuesday, it's not next Easter, it's not next year, it's not 2015. The time for goodness and our activity and participation in it is now. What you are doing, I am here tonight because I believe in what you are doing, I'm here to encourage you and I'm here to challenge you to even do more. The time is now. I, uh, I recall that Jesus said, your concern for others is the measure of your greatness. It's not how many families I have. It's not how many houses I have. It's not how many buildings I own. Your concern for others is the measure of your greatness. I remember, uh, I kind of like to think of Jeremiah as an economist. I'm an economist but, but the only thing economists are good for is to predict the future, right? They have all the charts, graphs, and all that stuff in, in order to try to predict the future. Okay, in 1650, the king sends Jeremiah out, and if he brings back a good report, he gets to keep his job. If he doesn't bring back a good report, he loses his head. Simple as that. So he says, go find out what this, what's going to happen in the future. Jeremiah comes back and he says, let not the wise man boast of his wisdom. Let not the strong man boast of his strength. Let not the rich man boast of his riches. But let him who would boast boast of this, that he knows me and understands that I am the God who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on this earth, and in these things I am well pleased, saith the Lord of hosts. You want to put it up? You want to put a smile on God's face? <laughs> Spend all the rest of your life, every ounce of energy you have, Helping other people become better off. Kindness, justice, righteousness. God is well pleased with that. So I say, 
I say division central. Let's do it together. I like our relationship. We can help you, you can help us. Together, my friends, we can do it. Together, we can do it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Jackson. Who am I supposed to say after that? <laughs> goodness, goodness, goodness. All right, well, what a wonderful evening this has been, and what a great gathering of you who believe that the noblest thing we can do is to care for those who at the moment need the assistance, the hope, and the love that only others can provide. Thanks again for your support and attendance this evening. Now to offer the closing benediction and the blessing for the evening is Bishop Bill Lyon Irons, who retired bishop of the Episcopal area and the man whose vision you and others have made a reality, Bishop Irons. Thank you, James. Thanks to all of you who've been touched by this evening, and we believe everything that's been said tonight, because it's right, and we understand that. Just a reminder that Mission Central keeps its doors open solely on the basis of your contributions. There is no contribution by the way of the annual conference or other entities of the church with the exception of local churches and people. And it is your contributions which keep the door open of love and goodness and understanding. It's been an incredible evening. There's an awful lot we've heard here that will help us tell this story in compelling ways in the future. And the people who've been recognized this evening, thank you for reminding the rest of us of what our lives are really about. We have a choral uh, benediction that our choir sometimes sings at the conclusion of the service. I will spare you my singing of it, but as I listen this evening, there are three parts of that blessing that we sing. And one line is, we remember hope. Extraordinary need in this world. And then the next line is, we remember love, the other great gift of God. And then the final line is, an address to God, we remember you. And as we remember the you that is God, we also remember the you that is the other children of God who wait for us to share with them what God gives us to share. Let us pray. Oh God, we are grateful that you have been here this night. We are grateful for those who have borne witness among us that what you call us to do is always more than we could ever imagine at the beginning. But hand in hand with you, we can do things that you call us to do far beyond anything we could have thought of ourselves. So we commit to you that we shall walk in your presence and offer our presence to you that you may walk in our presence. Grant us safe journeys to our home, safe journeys for our hearts, <coughs> 